Hello, I can see some new faces and some faces that were here earlier. We are going to start our second talk uh, today, which will be presented by Andrew Arms and Dennis Berg from the Spring Project. Please welcome them. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. So, um, I may pose a few questions in your mind. Um, at the Spring Project, we work with a lot of uh, particularly young people um, and helping them find their brilliance. Uh, with a lot of people, we find that uh, somewhere along the line, they became disconnected with the things that drive them. and. Many people say to us, uh, when we ask them what they really want to do, um, that they don't even know who they are. Somewhere in our education, uh, we become disconnected. And there are a number of things that happen in the process which begin to disconnect us from quite an early age. Um, so at the Spring Project, we, it was founded by three of us, Andrew, myself and Darius, who's elsewhere doing something else at this moment. Um, and we come from different directions, pretty much to the same conclusions. And uh, we work in a variety of different contexts. For, instance, for example, one of the things I do is to work with sports people. And I like particularly working with sports people because the work we do is measurable. When we do something and we connect someone with what drives them, we can measure the result in seconds coming off the time or uh, scores going up and so on. So that for me is also a good research area um, because it's very easy in this field to get very theoretical and get disconnected from the, the real um, manifestation of the results. So um, I have a little exercise which I'm, I'm going to uh, suggest that we try. And this is a kind of, it can be 
taken in several ways, but it's a kind of um, test, if you like, of or a measurement of our, uh, the degree of how much we're connected from our highest brain function through to our body. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to do is to join your hands together like this. Just interlock your fingers and then uh, hold your index fingers parallel. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to physically hold your fingers as strongly parallel as you can. So you're physically keeping your fingers straight. Okay. Meanwhile, what I'm going to ask you to do is, before we start, just bring your fingers together and see what that looks like. Feel what it feels like. And even if you can in this noise, hear what it sounds like as they touch. Then hold them physically apart and in your mind, picture them coming together, feel them coming together, and even hear them coming together. And just concentrate on that and see if there's anything happening. Yeah. So I can see some smiles and laughing. So can I get some reactions from you? What are you feeling when you do that? What was the experience for you? Yeah. Yes. Right, so is there a fight going on? Oh, thank you, great. Thank you, great. Anybody else? What did you experience? I'm, I'm thinking I've got the same thing. It, just, it, it felt like the fingers were trying to come together uh, physically, yeah. even though I was trying to keep them apart and um, thinking about them coming together. Great. So uh, there's kind of a, a couple of things. Some of you may have got no, no reaction whatsoever. Um, I've you know, done this with many hundreds of people, and... Um, you get a certain number of people who are sitting there and they're looking and there's nothing happening and there's no fight going on and there's no... If you've, um, <coughs> excuse me, mastered the ability of disconnecting your mind from your body, um, then you're pretty much going to do what goes on in your head is disconnected from what, sh what goes on physically. Um, that in the long term has a negative impact on your physical presence and on your ability to be present. So uh, we can practice to become somewhere else mentally. And this has consequences. Uh, equally, if your mind and body, the connections in your brain between the bits that control your body and your mind are well connected, then if you try physically to resist what your mind is doing, the result is stress. The, your level of tension goes up, your heart rate will increase, some of the chemicals being released into your bloodstream will be getting ready for action, for fight or flight. And this is an experience that many of us live with daily. If you just listen to what's going on around you and look at the environment we're in, there's something, there's certain messages going on to our body which may be contrary to what's going on in our mind. And this uses up our resources. So um, the result is that our body and our mind begin to fight each other. What I'm going to ask you to do is to do it again. And this time, only hold your fingers apart and give no resistance. But make no effort to bring your fingers together. Just picture it happening and see if uh, what your mind's doing can create the result. So no resistance, just see them coming together and see what happens.
Now, almost we go, well, if you relax your fingers, they're going to come together. So how about if you do it the other way around? So you start with your fingers together and picture them becoming parallel. And see if you can concentrate, see it, hear it, and feel it. And see if the result is the same. So there's an element that are, are what we're interested in a sense is, and perha perhaps what we're all interested in, is manifestation. When we create anything in any context, whether it's making something out of wood or writing a program, creating a game, uh, producing a product, creating value in the world, we're interested in manifestation. We have something that starts in our mind, and if it stays there and goes nowhere, it creates no value and has no impact on the world. Or it may have some, but minimal. On the other hand, if we can perfect the art of uh, developing that connection so that when our mind has vision very powerfully, and that's connected into the physical universe, then we start to manifest something. So for example, one of our practices at the Spring Project is we don't really market what we do. What we do is we get clearer. So when we want the phone to ring, or we want more projects or activities to be happening, or people to get involved in the projects, we get clearer. So we, we sit down together and we get clearer about the vision. And we practice this element where if we're really clear in the vision that we're holding, and we connect that through, the phone starts ringing, people get in touch, stuff happens, and the levels of activity go up. There's a natural cycle that there's a, a period of activity which then begins to, everything has a life cycle. It begins to come round to the next part, and you pretty much have to have other projects ready to go uh, for that to happen. And we find that keeping that um, activity, level of activity and energy in the project is a question of getting clearer and clearer and continually coming back. Activity kind of muddies the clarity and we, our job is to keep coming back to that clarity and to keep this strength of vision. So um, my background um, is in, uh, in a martial art. Uh, originally, I've, I uh, was very fortunate in that I was taken as apprentice as a young 25-year-old with a, with a master. And I was with him for 21 years. And uh, it was very intensive training. But the art is not about fighting. It's about peace. It's about removing the violence in yourself. And it's very much to do with if I have the power in my mind to heal the causes of violence in myself, then that begins to radiate outwards. And so uh, what we did when we came to think about how we were going to create the Spring Project, what we were going to do, why we were going to do it, our thinking was really about what are the big problems out there? What does it all boil down to? If we think about sustainability in the world, about employment models, about economic issues, the imbalances, the things that the world that has been created that is not so healthy. What are the root causes of those things, if you like, in the, in the human source code? What do we have to get back to, to get back on track? And um, Andrew, speaks beautifully about sustainability and how um, if we get away from our own core and our own self, it becomes increasingly difficult to create a sustainable future. Okay, thank you.
Brilliant. That's, that's not the last you're going to hear from Dennis. He's going <laughs> to come back in. So yeah, my background is in large corporate organizations. And towards the end of my kind of corporate career, before I came together with Dennis and Darius and set up the Spring Project, I was working for a very similar organization to Telefonica. And I remember a conversation I had with the CEO just before he hired me, actually. And he said, what I would like to do is I'd like to create a learning organization. I'd like you to come in and create the conditions for people to every day turn up and feel like they were bringing their full contribution to work. I was like, wow, what a great job. Yeah, that's my job is like to do that for this organization. And rather naively at the time, despite the fact that it was towards the end of my kind of corporate career, I thought, yeah, I can do this. You know, this is the fr I've been given the free space now by which to, you know, design something for this organization that it, you know, everybody turns up every day and they love what they're doing. It's like they cannot believe they come to work for this organization. And naively, because you know, once I started, I really got back into the whole politics of being in a very large global organization where kind of shareholder value was placed ahead of pretty much everything else, you know, the well-being of the staff being one of those things. And, and through that process of learning that, you know, this was going to be a very difficult thing to do, I learned a lot of things about myself. And this is what Dennis was talking about. You know, that tension within myself was the biggest learning. I was, like, I was really clear about, okay, you know, what is it within myself that I'm going to need to change in order to bring this about? What is really going to you know, make the biggest difference, have the biggest impact? And actually, what I had to do was tell the organization I couldn't do it. And I had to leave. And that actually had a very profound effect on the organization. Because the CEO was there going, I've hired you to do this, and you're telling me you can't do it. And as far as he was concerned, I was the expert in that field. It's like he hired me because I'd done some great stuff at other organizations. And I was like, yeah, within this organization and the current values in which it operates, it's not going to achieve what you want as far as I can do it. And I needed to leave in order for that organization to actually go, oh, now we need to kind of listen to what he's saying, even though he's now no longer working here. <laughs> and so when we came together in the Spring Project, we worked really, really hard on the work that we wanted to do. It was like, if this is what we want to create in the world, it's like the opportunity for people to understand themselves deeply, to understand how they can also unlock clarity within themselves and that clarity that Dennis is talking about that is going to allow them to bring their full contribution. We had to be an expression of it. And we sat down and we spoke nearly for two years before we did any work whatsoever so that we were really clear about this is our vision. This is our, And we often you know, still get a little bit drawn off course. And this isn't like kind of when you've worked it out, you know, now everything is done. You've kind of got to keep working at it. It's kind of as we learn more about ourselves, you know, apply our brilliance to the world, you know, we change. And we have to keep constantly getting in touch with that in order to make sure we're on vision and clear. And through that process of exploration and working with many thousands of young people, we created, as Dennis talked, the source code, the human source code. And what I'm going to do is just explain briefly what we're doing here this week, why we're here, how you can explore more of it, what we're going to maybe do over the last kind of 20 minutes. And you know, if you're curious and interested, how you can explore it much more deeply with us, because we're here all week. And so our job here as a Spring Project is to make this available to as many campus heroes, ma as many visitors, as guests as possible. And you may have seen an equation up there, and this is how we're framing it this week, the equation of the human source code, which is brilliance equals integrity multiplied by responsibility in brackets, times by curiosity. And we've been working on a series of practices, a series of exercises, honing our ability and skills by which to deliver those elements as powerfully and as a short a space of time as possible. So people can also tune into their brilliance as quickly as possible. And what we've also done is we've learned methods by which to deliver this to large crowds of people in a very short period of time. And so Telefonica, they were interested in what we were doing. They were like, we want, we want you to come in and hire the team that put this event on. So it's not the whole team, but a lot of the people responsible for the content that's going on on all these stages, all the keynote speakers, all the people that you'll see throughout this week. 
It's like we were responsible for hiring that team. And at the core of what we were doing was making sure we were hiring a team that felt like it was bringing its brilliance to the event. It was like these people needed to turn up every day and feel like, yeah, you know what? If our job is to inspire a whole generation of technology loving, you know, passionate people, this is where we're going to do it. This is how we're going to do it. And so we hired the team, and they were like, we love what you've done there. We want you to make this technology, this technology of body and mind, available to everybody. So we're going to be here all week. This is the first speech speaking slot that we've taken. And we're just contextualizing for a small group of people that were curious enough to turn up and see what we're doing. And there are going to be workshops throughout the week. We're doing some work in the marketplace. We're doing some employability training. We are doing other speaker slots. And we've also got some videos playing throughout the week that you'll be able to see. So if you're intrigued and want to explore much more deeply some of those concepts, you can really get into this stuff. And we've got the opportunities for you to do it. So that's kind of to contextualize what we're about. And if you go online and look, at, look up the human source code, you'll be able to see all of the links to all the different workshops that we're doing at the Campus Party website. Dennis. OK, thank you. So um, you remember those different uh, elements in the, in the formula? Um, and um, this morning, what was billed was curiosity. And curiously, we screened the film on integrity. Um, they're kind of really very interlinked and connected. And um, when you talk to people about what they understand by uh, curiosity, for example, um, I've come to the word uh, pretty much after I began to really explore the word and use the word after 30 years of, of studying, um, trying to figure out how to express something that uh, in my Aikido background, we, we fumbled around uh, for years. So uh, just to put it a little bit in context, my, my teacher's teacher was the founder of Aikido. And uh, he died in 1968. So it comes from a 2,000-year-old tradition, but it's a new, it's a new art. Um, and the, the founder of Aikido was a kind of Einstein figure who studied martial arts. He's Japanese. He studied martial arts for many years. And then he had a moment when he, he had a, a eureka moment or an insight moment quite a spiritually profound moment when he said, hang on, this is not about fighting and destruction. This is about love and protection for all things. And he began to talk about creating a sustainable future, world peace, things like this. And he started to talk about how we must train to remove the violence in ourselves first. Because if there's a little bit of it left in ourselves, it will find expression in the world outside us. And so basically, we must go inside first, and then we can uh, bring what we develop to the world. So he, he developed an extraordinary reputation in that back in those days in Japan, it was still traditional for top martial artists to challenge each other, samurai to challenge each other. And so occasionally, some guy would come along and challenge him. He was only about this tall. and. Um, they found that he would, whenever they attacked him, he would end up behind them. Or he would not be there. And there's a, f a famous story about when a swordsman came and challenged him and attacked him with a wooden sword and repeatedly cut to, to try and strike him. And every time he struck, he wasn't there anymore. He would be but suddenly behind him. And eventually, the uh, swordsman gave up. He was exhausted. Um, now, there's a rumor that the, um, the, the character Yoda was based on Osensi. I, I don't have absolute confirmation that it's true, but the parallels in the, in the characters are so many that it, it's, it's likely. Um, so there are a lot of things there that are fictionalized, 
And actually, some of the things I've seen and experienced are kind of really, to most people, the only way you could think of it is by thinking it's fiction. Um, but I have, for example, attacked senior teachers with a sword. And just as I was thinking that I'd hit them, the sword was deflected away. And your mind goes, I'm, I hit you. Why are you not there? And in my apprenticeship, my teacher used to make me do this every weekend to attack him, to demonstrate. The reason he was doing it wasn't because it was necessary for the course that we were putting on. The reason he was doing it was because it challenged the fear in me because I was, every time I attacked him, my belief wasn't strong enough and I thought, I'm going to hurt him. I'm going to hit him. And I loved the man. So the last thing I wanted to do was hit him on the head with a, with a stick. And so every time we did it, he confronted me with my fear and my ability to believe it was possible. Eventually, my fear went and I could attack him wholeheartedly with love in the, in the confidence that he would deflect it. And I remember him leaving it later and later and I used to see his hair go like this as I cut and the sword would would deflect off and move his hair. And he did this as an act of generosity to allow me to let go of my fear. Now, strangely, as my fear went, so my ability to do the same thing grew. So then I would have other people attack me with a sword and I would wait calmly with no fear. And I can tell you it's one of the most profound gifts that I've been given in my life is to lose fear and be able to walk into danger with no fear. It's total liberation. And so that's become one of the important things in my life that I want to share with people is liberation from fear, empowerment, freedom. And if we think about it, there are many things that hold us back in our thinking in what we dare do and in what we dare hope simply from fear. So for example, when I work with sports people, one of the main things that we have to confront is their fear of winning. I'm working, I've been working for a few years with a, an Olympic uh, modern pentathlete and we come against it again and again is that in order to win, she must dare to win. She must lose the fear of winning. It's surprisingly scary to think that you could become the best of the world at something or excel in something so much that other people start looking to you as an example. So I'm going to ask you for a moment to think about your brilliance what are you brilliant at? What is your gift to the world? And what I'm going to ask you to do as well, if you would be so kind, is to sit up and straight a little with both feet on the ground. And as your weight centers, to just become aware of this area here low down in your uh, abdomen. Now, uh, part of the feeling, if you bring your fingers back to this position and think about, bring to mind what your personal brilliance is, what your particular gift to the world is. What is the thing that you could really do exceptionally well that is your, your nature? brings to the world and kind of bring a parallel in your mind to bringing your fingers together as you bring your brilliance into focus and if you're now doing it from a center sitting straight letting the weight come through your center this is um, in a sense the center where our uh, universe that's non-physical and our universe that is physical 
intersects. So this, in a sense, is where the center of the universe for you is in this place. And if you're bringing your brilliance through this point to your fingers, now just observe if you hold them apart, focus your brilliance, and see how easily that comes into focus. This is just kind of linking a physical manifestation of what you're doing, of your brilliance. Notice if there's resistance in your body to your brilliance coming to focus. Or does it just come straight? Now, what I'd love to do with you is to invite you to join in and do some experiments. Um, the curiosity part is we like to do experiments approaching in an experimental mindset where we're saying, look, if I think this way or I think this way, um, it, produces, it produces a completely different effect, even on just the way my body functions. So there are some demonstrations. Um, if you're up to it, there's a demonstration that you can do with the person next to you. Who's up for doing something like that? It's a little test, little experiment. One person, any advance on one? You're up for it. Anybody willing to turn to their partner and connect with someone, do something? OK, so uh, we're going to go very quickly through a couple of experiments. We're going to compare one thing with another. So this is about um, assumptions that we have. We all have assumptions that are kind of deep in our basic programming. Now, we received those as we grew up. They, we received them mostly unconsciously. And we have lots of uh, messages that say, you're weak, your mind is strong, your body is weak, or your body is strong, your mind is weak, or lots of stuff that we've heard. Uh, lots of things like women are weaker than men. Um, all sorts of different messages we've, we've most of them could be challenged. But we've also been taught to question assumptions, in a sense, by justifying them. We've been taught to check assumptions and say, are they true? Now, one of the things that I look at is that assumptions don't have to be true to work for you. So what I'm going to ask you to do, would you, mm -hmm. is first of all, I'm going to ask him, so please be careful. Don't break each other's arms here. So I'm going to ask him if he's going to put one hand under here and one hand on here. And I'm going to try and be as strong as I can physically. And I'm going to ask him to bend my arm, and I'm resisting. OK. <laughs> OK, so I've basically I'm using one muscle, my triceps. And he's got his whole upper body that he can apply. OK? Now, like I say, go gently with each other. Be experimental, not competitive. OK? So now I'm going to use an image. And I'm going to imagine that my arm is actually a hose pipe. Or you could think of it as a, as a cable putting out a stream of negative ions. Or, if you like, uh, a good image is water flowing through, concentrating at the nozzle. And when I, I do this, if he starts to bend, I'm going to direct the flow. Uh, I'm actually aiming at the head of that bolt on the, on the side there. Okay. So when he starts to bend, my mind is going, there's a flow of uh, energy going in this direction. And so long as I keep my mind and body going in the same direction, he can't <laughs> bend my arm because he's got to bend my mind first. If my mind and body are one, the two become connected. So then actually, it's amazing what your body can do, way beyond what we think it can do. So you up for trying that. So the first one we're going to do is just get your, your whoever is next to you to bend your arm and resist first physically. So a good way to do that is to tense your arm. Now, we're doing 
clear experiment. So we want our brain to understand this is one where I'm resisting physically. And the next one, we use the image of the hose pipe, or if you prefer the cable with the stream of ions flowing out, or just flowing along and extending a flow of something, energy, coming out the end. OK? Go for it. Pardon? Oh, thank you. Before the that. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> There's a few going, whoa, <laughs> let me out of here. No, but um, if, if uh, you know, I think we could just kind of bring this up here. So we might we might need to capture just a couple of what are the options we have. Okay, so we're going to just pa pass the microphone around if to get um, some of your experiences. Does anyone want anybody want to tell us what they experienced when they were doing that? I, th I think Superman up there. Superman, come on! Wh what was your experience? <laughs> Can we get a mic up there? Uh, <laughs> if you wear a t-shirt like that, you're going <laughs> to get picked out, aren't you? <laughs> okay, um, it felt. Like with focusing the mind, it felt much easier to to resist, and I actually could do it. Uh. Lovely. We, we were we were actually just talking. We we're wondering whether um, it's an effect on the person who's resisting or the person who is uh, trying to um, sort of bend the arm. Yeah. So is is there anything in that? Maybe. Is yeah, absolutely. Um, I I've actually. I mean, we've we've. This was one of the first things I got shown uh, back in 35 years ago when I, when I first did Aikido. And um, I, you know, over the years, we've had many discussions. And I've even seen long articles written about why it doesn't mean anything, why it does mean something, why it, you know, lo lots of people get into big discussions about it. So I would say, yeah, both. And uh, this is kind of. To put it in context, with this particular exercise, I show six different levels of doing it. This is levels one and two. So when we get to uh, kind of some of the higher levels, the power that involved is way beyond anything possible. So um, the question is, does it have an impact on one person or the other? I would hope both because in my experience, what I'm doing is by changing the way my mind and body is interacting with me, it's rippling out and having effects on other people. So in time, what happens is that the effect of us being really in full integrity, mind and body as one, is that we begin to have an impact on people around us. So for example, um, you know, if you have a close relative or a friend who's had a, some event and is upset, um, how we sit with them can have a profound effect on their state. So one of my practices is to sit so with such deep and strong and powerful integrity 
that it draws other people to their integrity. If we um, go around practicing things that split us apart and create separations in ourselves, well, of course, we're going to do that with other people. So this looks like, and you use the word resist, it looks like one person resisting the other. But in fact, what we're doing is joining with them. It's a bit odd logic. I wonder if I could have two volunteers who are strong, good backs, who would be willing to lift me up together. Would anyone be willing to come out and, yeah, c come on. Would, how, how, how's your back? Are you, are, are you strong? No? I think, are you both coming down? Are you going to? Yeah, do. Okay. Okay, so that's fine. Don't want, don't want to. Yeah, great. Come, come. So I, I'm not that heavy, but. Um, so if you could come on this side and hold two hands like this. Yeah, come, come, come up. Yeah, two hands like this. And you hold two hands like this. So straight back, use your legs. Yeah. And what I want you to do is go one, two, three, and both lift me together. Yeah. Okay. When you're ready. Yeah. No, you're gonna you're gonna need to use your le your whole body. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm I'm a bit fatter than that. <laughs> yeah. So legs, legs. Yeah. One. Two. Okay. 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 So. Now, if I um, think, even if I think I want to resist, my mind and my energy goes that way, yeah? Their energy is going that way. So it's a question of who's strongest. Would you come and lift from behind as well to help, yeah? Okay. So you all, th all three together, if you put under my arms, okay. yeah. All three together, yeah? So they go one, two, three, up. Okay, easy now. Okay, thank you. Now. If I think I want to resist, our, en our energies are, uh, we're separated, we're going in opposite directions. But what I'm going to think now is I'm going to join with them, become one with them and help. So I'm not going to fight, I'm going to join in. So when they come to lift, I go, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go, <laughs> let's go. Yeah, come on, come on, up we go, yeah, oh, up we go, up we go. So long as I become one with them, how can I lose? So, th so integrity or loss of integrity is when something breaks apart. If something is one, it cannot be separated. If we become one, we cannot be separated. So they can only lift me up if they lift themselves up too. Yeah, so it's odd logic, maybe, but maybe it'll ring some resonance with, with you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so um, what I'm hoping that you've got a taste of is that the power of your integrity um, is maybe infinitely more powerful than you've dared to dream. We know no limits. We've been developing in my field for several generations, many generations, and each one has passed on what they've learned. My teacher, for example, said to me, um, I've taught you so that you can go now go and improve the way we teach this. You must go and develop it. So each one passes it on to the next, and lifetimes are added of study. And we have not as yet found any limits. Nobody has lived long enough to reach a limit of human capacity. So who knows what your potential is? So it's just alerting you to a possibility. Okay. Lovely. So one last comment, and then we're going to take some questions um, about the Spring Project. So one thing that we realized that was very important for our well-being to remove the kind of fear within ourselves was to do work that had certain characteristics about it. And you know, this is what the Spring Project is. You know, it's about a lot of things, but is one way of summarizing what we're all about. We're interested in doing work that serves us as individuals, 
but serves whoever we're working with, so you guys, you know, so that you're left in a better place. And more importantly for us is that it's going to serve generations to come. And that's the only work we're interested in doing. And if it has those three characteristics, then we are, we feel, in integrity to ourselves. And so the Spring Project is all about that. It's about bringing that concept of everybody can be OK. You can be OK. Who you're working with can be better off. You know, everybody wins. And actually, the future generations win as well. And that, to us, is true sustainability. Work created with that ethos in place is truly sustainable. If any one of those elements, yourself, your clients, your customers, your relationships, or the people to come, are not better off from the work that you're doing, then to us, that's unsustainable. It might be a long, a long wave, but for us, that's unsustainable. And that, to us, is also the expression of total connectivity rather than separation between you and me and actually the people that may be impacted by the work that we do. So that's what the Spring Project's all about. It's a big, a big vision. We're in it for the long haul. We've been going for five years. We're delighted to be here supporting Telefonica to do what we believe is work in that category, supporting you guys to bring your brilliance to the world. And we want to do whatever we can to support you to do that. So thank you very much. And I think we've got 10 minutes or so for questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Andrew. I will pass the microphone around for anybody who would like to ask some questions. Please raise your hands. Anything you would like to say? Hi. Uh, are you working on any project in particular at the moment? Who, what are your main objectives on the short term? Uh, have you got clients in particular you're working with or something like that? Yeah, we, we have uh, one project. We, got, we have a number of projects. So part of the way that we're lo looking at working with, with people is to create a kind of nursery for different ways of working together for co-creation. So we have, uh, we're developing something called Navitas, which is an online platform for bringing people projects all with this criteria of win-win-win. Um, so the idea of bringing people together, maybe all around the world or locally, to work on projects together um, in a way that benefits them. Some of them will be funded, some of them are voluntary. And it's bringing people together with the project that speaks to them, giving them opportunities to work and create, kind of create a marketplace for people so they can uh, develop their skills, find a, a market for those skills, maybe get together and form enterprises together. Um, it's kind of uh, creating a micro-economy within uh, a kind of potentially worldwide community. Um, so there's, it's quite an ambitious uh, project to create this online platform for it. Um, but within that, there would be lots of projects running. So there'd be co-creative space and different people working together on different things. And uh, there are some great charities, corporates, different people who, are bringing, who would bring the projects to that. So there, there might be a big variety of interesting work available. Um, and uh, hopefully, opening up op opportunities for people. Um, so I could go on about it, but I think that's probably pots it well enough. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yeah. Hi. Uh, just interested in the uh, arm experiment. If you were to separate the group yeah. and send half of them out the room so they don't hear the briefing, yeah. is the effect multiplied or, or is it less? Or have you not done it? I'm just interested in the experiment. Sorry, you mean you mean um, take people out so they don't know what to expect? So the, the people that are trying to bend the arm yeah. are out of the room, so they don't know the, the, the kind of theory of, of, of aiming for something. What, what, what's the... Okay, I so... Guess, how does that change the impact of that exercise? Does it ba basically, the, the exercise has been something we've studied for about 50 years. Okay. So we pretty much have tried everything. Um, so I, I'd say yes. 
I, I was particularly curious at one time to, um, to test it for myself, you know, test these things. Yeah. So I wanted to do it with people that didn't know, didn't expect what was happening. So I've put myself in positions at times where um, I've, you know, even had weightlifters uh, come and come in direct and go, someone's saying to them, this guy reckons you can't bend his arm. Uh, or this guy reckons you can't lift him up. And they've got a very competitive mindset. Now, when I talked about levels, the competitive level is kind of level two. So what happens, the difficulty is that if I try and do something and be one with the other person mentally, uh, but my mind gets caught up by the competitive element of someone competing with me, it can be difficult for me to keep a clear focus. So that takes practice. So I, I've been doing this for, for 35 years. And I, I've tested it, and I've been, I've been even been attacked by people trying to prove that this, the Aikido doesn't work. And uh, I've pretty much proved to myself that it does. So um, there are some pretty odd things that have happened. I haven't been in a situation for many years, but I used to find myself in situations where I would come across someone being threatened or physically attacked, and I would step in to protect someone. Um, a few times I've actually been attacked by people who heard I was a senior Aikido practitioner and they wanted to prove it was rubbish. So I have actually been attacked physically and I've used these same things with someone who's really trying to hurt me. Um, nine times out of ten, it's over before anything happens. Actually, you calm them down and they lose the will to, to attack. One time out of ten, you have to use it, and it works. And I've been amazed at how easy it is. Someone who's quite big and is being physically violent, you hold them on with one finger, it's nothing. And you kind of go, wow, it really works. So again, you know, I, what I've experienced has convinced me this is only hearsay for you. And I, and I do believe in proof. So uh, I can only give you my assurance. Uh, Check it out. Have a look on the internet. And and this, okay. you know, j just to be clear, you know, this is as much. Yeah, if you imagine energy coming together, you know, you you come up against energy in relationships all the time. The people sitting next to you right now, your loved ones, maybe a boss, maybe you know, maybe you know, it's maybe somebody who who technically has some authority over you. This the same principles apply in the interaction of two people, even just in a kind of emotional, non-physical environment. If you come with, you know, essentially peace of mind to that situation, the, the consequences of that interaction are much more likely to be bountiful than if you are coming with fear, resistance, you know, separation from that person. So although this is a physical practice we've talked about, this is something that you pr can practice every moment of every day with whoever you come into contact with. And if you become aware and curious about how you are coming to that relationship, then you can practice coming with a different way of being. And these are the practices that we can give and we explore with everybody that comes through our training. It's like, oh my goodness, although that's a physical representation of this, my relationships have been transformed by simply using it in a relationship perspective rather than in a, oh, it's a physical interaction. It's energy coming together and how you use it, you know, it can be brilliant and abundant or it can be I want, you know, I want to put you down on the floor, metaphorically or actually physically. Do we have time for one more, or is that it? We yeah, just a very quick one question. <laughs> Hi there. Um, sorry, you mentioned earlier that you quite enjoyed working with uh, sports people because the outcome was quite measurable and you could see um, the difference. Um, with the sort of other style of people that you work with where the outcomes aren't so obvious, what, what kind of metrics do you use to, to measure sort of any improvement over the, uh, the course of, of what you do? It's a um, good, good question. It's, it depends on the environment. So, uh, for instance, if we're working with a, with a, uh, a corporate uh, body, um, they will come with certain ideas about what they want to achieve. And, and we would uh, look at measurements within that. Um, 
in the process of that, of course, we would look at whether it was win-win-win. Um, because in the past, I've worked with, for example, large banks or large financial institutions. Create, uh, co had quite a strong stimulating effect on entrepreneurship, only to find that it wasn't necessarily a win-win-win in the long term. Um, so one learns, and, and we, this is why we bring this measurement of, is this really good for the f for, for future? So we would work with anybody, um, you know, for, so for example, if we work with young people who are, who are unemployed, young, young unemployed graduates, one of the measurements is um, what happens for them afterwards. Um, do they find employment, or if that's what they're looking for, or more importantly, do they find the thing that they want to do? Um, and we have a lot of uh, emails, for example, from people we've worked with who, who are emailing going, thank you, uh, I, was, you know, I was looking for jobs, that wasn't what I wanted to do, I wanted to do this, now I'm doing it, and it's happening for me. And it's amazing how when the alignment comes between uh, what's, you know, someone's integrity and their vision, things start to happen for them. So those kind of things we, we do measure. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much for your questions, for your answers and your presentation. I think we'll stop here. Yeah. And I hope to see you later this week. We'll have Andrew on stage at fr on Friday as well. And as you were told, there will be workshops running at Bar Camp. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.